Hi, Mickey. Mickey. Who's Mickey. Who's that? Mickey, wake up. Why? Oh, Bob, why are you waking me up? I'm on vacation. Hey, I'm on vacation. Why are we doing this? This, this town's not listening. big enough for two guys on vacation. It's uh, August. Nobody's listening. I'm getting no clicks on Twitter. Uh, how many clicks do you normally get on Twitter, Mickey? Be honest. More than I'm getting now. And also, do we call them qu clicks? I don't think we do. Oh, whatever. Maybe whatever that's the problem. Them. You've been completely misconceptualizing the Twitter situation. Um, so, no, <laughs> well, I'm on... Not only am I on vacation, but... Uncharacteristically, I've spent the ca past couple of days uh, on a non-working vacation and have been immersed in, in family-related things. And so I was counting on you to tell me what's going on in the world. I, I have uh, almost no idea. Boy, are you mistaken. But I think our... Re our I keep calling them our readers. Our That's readers fine. who click on us. They, they will uh, be soon if we keep going at this point. Uh, uh, we go, we're going the extra mile here. Yeah, no, we're on vacation. I mean, some people just, they, they like do reruns when they're on vacation. Right, or they do something that's like been in the can for a month. Right. Uh, that's timeless. But we're up to the second. Um, now, now there the is one, there is one aberration here, it, which is, uh, to accommodate your jam packed vacation schedule, uh, we're taping Thursday instead of Friday. This is going to post. Thursday evening, the Parrot Room, which we're taping later today, will post Friday. Uh, Friday okay, evening. thank you for that. Um, yes. Uh, the answer is, uh, we're still withdrawing from Afghanistan and there are explosions at the Kabul airport. Uh, that's what everybody was... One of the things people were ter were scared about is terrorism at the Kabul airport. Yeah, so, is that all we know now? I, I uh, just glancing 13 at dead. That's all I know. Thirteen. I hadn't heard. That. I, I was. Uh, I just glanced at Twitter right before we taped and saw that some people are attributing it to ISIS or ISIS Khorasan. I, 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 I just saw the headline: thirteen no well, what, dead. It, what obviously, I've seen, that might rise. What What I've seen is that people I trust on these things are complaining that. Uh, other people are saying are are acting as if uh, ISIS and the Taliban would be in league in this. I mean, ISIS and, Tal and the Taliban have a history of antagonism, and if this is ISIS, it would be more likely they were saying these people I trust a, a kind of challenge to the Taliban's authority. Right, but it's still terrorism that kills a bunch of people. It is still it's it's uh, bad. I condemn you know, terrorism, Mickey. Um. Right. The, uh, I, uh, the Taliban have deep ties to Al-Qaeda and they don't like ISIS. Correct. Apparently. Which, you know, Leon Panetta, who was once Secretary of Defense, evinced no awareness of, but maybe I complained about that last week. Uh, no, you didn't. Um, did you read Sarah Chase's essay? No, I saw you tweeted it. W what's it, the so? Give me so I'm, was, so I'm reacting fresh. You you hailed it as as a, a great. Well, it, it's been built. To, it was built to me as so great. Sarah Chase is, of course, under under Mike Kinsley's Hernstein principle. She is the daughter of Abram Chase, the who is he Harvard law professor and and State Department, I believe, official, who was one of the smarter men around. Uh, and she had gone to work in Afghanistan. She speaks Pashtun. Uh, and she makes a couple of points. The obvious one is she, she brings up is, is, is how deep the corruption was. Uh, the, and, um, people would come to her office and say, you know, uh, locals would come to her office and say, the Taliban used to slap us on this cheek and now the government slaps us on this cheek. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we get slapped either way. Uh, what's in it for us? And, um, uh, also points out that the interagency consensus, the god of Colonel Vindman, made actually a conscious mm. decision to not battle corruption in 2011. Uh, now, uh, maybe that has, been, has anybody ever successfully battled entrenched corruption? I don't know if that's true or not, but, but, you know, do you know, have you know any case where that's actually been done? Well, sure. I'm, I know, but I'm sure it's happened in some sense of the word corruption somewhere in the world. But the question is how much leverage we had. You'd think we had some, but at the same time, I mean, this is, yeah, this sounds like I, I would agree with the implication about what the larger problem is. You know, we, we don't know that much about this country 
the information coming back to us is biased in favor of good news, just institutionally, because people don't want to, you know, generals don't want to end their tours of duty and report that they right. failed. And and the, for that matter, I think there's there's a bias in even right. State Department information. And uh, and and then we have an imperative to shovel tons, tons of money there into a place we don't know much about. And inevitably, you're going to get a fair yeah. amount of corruption. I, I don't say, you know. But it's much worse than that, Bob. If you keep reading, that's only her first point. I didn't read her any second, of it. So, her yeah. second point is that the, the Taliban was set up entirely by the ISI in Pakistan. It started in Pakistan. They poll tested the word Taliban <laughs> and discovered that it, it uh, you know, it resonated because they seemed like studious young men. Uh, and so this is all a, Tal a Pakistan operation. And third, all the people we thought were our allies are in on this latest cave-in. Karzai, Abdullah, Abdullah, the what people is the, we thought. What, it, what is the latest cave-in? That they arranged for the Taliban to take over as soon as we, as soon as our, 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 mm. uh, our date for leaving, what they, you know, and mm. ar arguably that's good because it was a peaceful transition of power. I mean, you know, pe fewer people were killed than if there was a war, but this whole thing was wired. By Karzai, the guy whose name is on the fucking airport, who was, you know, spoke before Congress and he was our great ally. He's the guy that, that sold, you know, sold out the current government. Uh, and it's all a setup and we should, we just had no fucking idea what was going on. You know what this and reminds we should just me of? Get the fuck out. You know what this, uh, I, I applaud your sentiment entirely. You know what it reminds <laughs> me of? Remember Tora Bora? In 2001, yeah. we, we thought, or maybe early 2002, I don't know, we thought we had, uh, Bin Laden bottled up in Tora, uh, Tora Bora. And as I understand it, I could be wrong, but we decided rather than send a bunch of Americans in to, to just, you know, just cover the, the mountains and Americans who would make sure he's dead, dead, dead. We paid some local guys to do the job and to caricature what happened, Bin Laden said to the local guys, how much did they pay you? <laughs> well, we can do better than that. I mean, they just, I, I think they just paid him off and, and, and he escaped. And, and it's like, uh, well, we don't know what we're doing there. Well, well, that was because we had had success with this strategy in the North, uh, with relying on locals and ha having a light footprint. So I guess they decided, Hey, we'll try that at Tora Bora too. And that was a mistake. Um, but, but yeah, no, this is, uh, that, that sounds like this essay does uh, but, capture but, a big part of what I see as the problem. And it's, it, it, but anyway, it's, it, it, she even cast aspersions on Zalme Khalilzad. Am I pronouncing his name right? Who is yeah, our... I've heard people complain, especially people on the right complain that he's an incompetent or something. I haven't heard uh, things, complaints beyond that. What does she say? He, he's, he is well, she... forever. I mean, he, he goes back to the Bush administration as like our Afghanistan right. liaison. I mean, he is of Afghan heritage. Is that, if I recall right. correctly? And, right. And so he's uniquely qualified, but her, anyway, she does, she just casts vague aspersions that maybe he's, uh, it, you know, he's not unlike Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah and having, conflicting loyalties but um it's uh it, it, that part she doesn't really she doesn't flush out that much of it but um she doesn't flush out that one at all but um it's it's an eye-opening uh essay and 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 it makes makes you think that we were like we've been clueless for four straight administrations oh i think so i think so um and uh we remain clueless i i uh yeah, I'm. I'm. I mean, yeah. it, it is a hard thing to do, you know. It's so like just it's it's like being in the world's worst marriage, and it never being a good time to get out because it's going to hurt the kids and so on. I mean, this maybe trivializes it this particular metaphor, but there are situations. Uh, I mean, I've never been in that one, but uh, there are situations where you kind of have to pull the bandaid off. You uh, know. I, what does this do for the Eli Lake solution, which is keep thirty five hundred men and. Uh, and we could held them at bay in perpetuity. I don't know if well, it makes it worse or better. You're still impeding. Uh, I mean, I mean, first, first question is, do you mean forever, or do you mean for five years or what? If if you mean forever, tell us you mean forever. Okay, let's talk about the idea of us being in that situation in a foreign country well, where we're killing their people from the air 
with with very low risk to our people. And by the way, if anything, that probably helps the terrorist recruiters who want to recruit homegrown terrorists in America. And, and they have used our troops in Afghanistan and Iraq and so on successfully in those recruitment campaigns. But it's probably better for them if we look like these wimps who never get our people killed, but we use our technology to kill them. And every once in a while, a drone strike go, goes astray and we and we do a wedding. You know, I mean, it, it, do the, if they want that situation forever, first of all, say that. And if they don't, why? Sh- what is their reason for believing it wouldn't be forever? Why would things ever change? We obviously don't know what we're doing. The, the, uh, under this situation, things have gotten worse in the sense of the Taliban on balance gaining ground. Um, well, you get the impression that the corruption would be what would be making us stay, because if we're there pouring billions of dollars into the country, that's that's a lot of uh, money that the elite can siphon off. And that's what makes them want us to stay, right? Uh, yeah, that, totally. That, imp- that implies they have a reason to hold off the Taliban because to keep the cash coming. Um, well, uh, Petraeus did say we were there forever. I mean, he, he, he was honest enough to say his, well, his notion was that we never leave. I commend his candor. Um, anyway, I recommend that. And, and you sort of wonder, uh, given, even with the, you know, given that there was a date that was set for leaving by Trump, everything else that follows follows from that date. I mean, obviously, once you set the date, the machinations start with Karzai and Abdullah in Pakistan, and they arrange for this, uh, you know, they arrange to buy off the officials and everybody uh, who was on our side suddenly surrenders. And uh, that's sort of baked in the cake. There's nothing we could do about it. It's not like... It's not like Biden could have done some brilliant thing, given that there was a date that we were leaving that, 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 would, that would have awarded it off. And, and arguably, it's not such a bad thing. A, the fewer casualties and B, uh, presumably, uh, you know, if all these eminent people are involved, maybe they'll be a little more civilized than they were last time. Um, well, I think on the first point, yeah, I mean, uh, if you assume that the Taliban would have taken over, you know, within a year or two, which most people think, then this is a relatively bloodless way for that to happen. I mean, we could be talking tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of deaths if, if there were a truly protracted um, civil war. And then, wait, what is the second point? You, you said something. The second point was, will they be more civilized? Well, I think, I mean, what you're hearing on that score is, A, this is a different... You know, demographically, a slightly different Taliban. I mean, I mean, the, there's a lot of of people who were, uh, who, you know, weren't even involved uh, back in the in the days of nine eleven. Uh, and the idea, what you hear is they're more cosmopolitan. I mean, that's not a very high bar if you remember how cosmopolitan the old Taliban was. But, but I, I think the promising sign is that they do seem to care about world opinion and the opinion of global elites. And the, the the trick is to make them keep caring, right? The trick is for this not to just be a ruse that, that uh, you know, gets them past the, you know, uh, the next few months uh, and then they secure control and return to their old ways. I, I don't, I, I don't think we have, well, go ahead. What were you going to say? Why well, I, I find it hard to believe that anybody cares a lot about the opinion of global elites when they have military control. Well, no, they they want uh, they want certain kinds of economic engagement. I mean, for now, we have frozen the assets of the Afghan government. They want access to that. They want they want look. They want uh, there are other things that have been frozen. They want uh, access to actual. I mean, the, you know, the government had become very aid dependent. And that's where they are kind of economically. It's not like it's this thriving economy. Even if it were, though, they would want access to global markets, right? Um, so there, there's, there's reasons. Uh, I, I mean, they don't want, uh, I think, widespread sentiment in the European Union that they should be subject to sanctions forever. Um, the, again, the trick is to make that not, not a binary thing. Like, okay, they get the economic relief. Um, you know, there needs to be some degree of ongoing conditionality, uh, either so, implicitly. So sanctions or are working. Well, look, here's the thing about sanctions: they could, in theory, work uh, often. 
The problem is that in our political system, they are never wielded wisely. You know, it's like you slapped him on Venezuela, you slapped him on Cuba, and whatever lobby was advocating them uh, is not they 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 don't see things very clearly and they don't really have the and they seem not to have the people's actual interests at least short term interests at heart um anyway i mean sanctions almost never work when they are a product of the american political system occasionally they do the the iran sanctions which by the way were highly multilateral did lead to the nuclear deal uh, which proved temporary, thanks to Trump. But uh, they did they did lead to that. You know, I think in this case, part of withdrawal uh, is to accept that we are not the sole or even the main players here. I think part of the logic of this should be, look, there are regional powers uh, that have an interest in stability in Afghanistan and... Uh, you know, and 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 that's going to have to be a big part of the impetus. And for that matter, Europe is you know uh, they 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 Europe isn't you know doesn't abut. Uh, well, most European countries don't abut Afghanistan the way uh, say you know um, China does, Pakistan does. But um, they're a lot closer to Afghanistan than we are. I mean, once we've absorbed our refugees, Europe. You know we're not gonna we're not we're not gonna keep that policy open and and Europe doesn't want a lot of refugees they don't want jihadists you know why uh, can't the refugees go to Islamic countries? Uh, some could but uh, some of these countries I mean Turkey for example has a ton of Syrian refugees already they're not in the mood they've got millions I mean not that they are not somewhat responsible for the refugee situation but as a political matter. Turkey's Turkey I if I got my numbers right I think they have several million Syrian refugees right now. So look there are other Muslim countries and uh, fine lobby them and and uh but it, 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 there seems to be this assumption in the press in Axios today there was this article the path to America as if the only path for the 80,000 people we've gotten out so far is coming to America. I think we have an obligation to get them out. I don't see why we necessarily have an obligation to bring more all 80,000 as opposed to a fair share here. No, we don't. I mean, I would say, you know, it was it was our war. I, I mean, you know, we had allies, of course, but it was uh, in reaction to an attack on the U.S. Um, but I don't have, look, fine, if you can find countries willing to take them. And, and there are a lot of countries that have been more generous about this than we have as a rule, uh, like Germany. Um, um, yeah, I... I, I, you know, uh, people on my side are, are 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 saying we should evacuate the Americans first, and I tend to agree with that. But I, I'm sort of, I'm not sure that it's a ironclad principle. I mean, what if, what if there were some Afghans who were work with us who were in grave danger, but somehow the Taliban don't kill Americans because they're Americans and they're, you know, uh, that is often the case that Americans have a sort of protected yeah. status. Um, uh, so then we should take the Afghans first. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I think as long as we're sitting on the assets of the of the government, if they're as big as I think they are, we're probably not going to have trouble getting Americans out. I, I think you're right. And and, and the, the ones, the people that the Taliban really wants to screen are Afghans. Some of them, they're probably happy to have gone and well, some of them not. What do you mean sitting on the what of the government? There's all these all these financial assets that we have frozen of the that that are due the Afghan government, but once the Taliban took over, we froze the assets. They don't have access to them. What if they decide the best way to do that is to take hostages? Um, I wouldn't recommend that, <laughs> but because uh, I don't think I don't think American politics permit Biden to uh, to cave there. But who knows? I, I honestly. I've been a little surprised that he hasn't uh, insisted on more shows of manhood than he's insisted on. I mean, for example, when the Taliban said you got to be out by August 31st, would have been a good political move if he could have arranged it to say, sorry, we need a few more days and we'll let you know. Meanwhile, negotiating, backdoor negotiation, we are communicating with him and just explain the thing. Look, we got to have three days. We swear September 3rd. Uh, if we miss that, you can do what you want, but we got to act tough here. I'm surprised that, that, I mean, maybe they just didn't think they could, they could arrange it, but, uh, 
in a way, I credit Biden. I mean, he's, he's, he's you know, with the whole, with, with the general drift of his policy, it's like, no, we're getting out. And, and that takes, you know, you're bucking so much of the establishment. You're bucking all these talking heads on cable news who are, uh, I mean, they may not be complaining about withdrawal per se, but they are giving him a very hard time about how this is proceeding. Um, he's too old for shows of manhood. Uh, have you, has he ever told you how many push ups he can do, Mickey? More than you, buddy. Uh, is that was that was no, he, that what he, he told the dog faced pony soldier? He he told he challenged some guy to a push up contest. Not I mean not that long ago I think some guy in the crowd. You know this is vintage Biden. Well, the push ups are the last to go. You know they are. They're the they're the, the yes. The, yeah, uh, they go they go after the manhood. Um, so can I ask? Can I? I'd like to crowdsource a question I have about Afghanistan and terrorism. Um. There's there's concern that it will become a platform for terrorism. And OK, the the kind of the worst case, you know, barring nukes or something is something like 9-11 that takes elaborate planning. And first thing about 9-11 is like you wouldn't think you need like a big patch of turf in a country like. Yeah, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden did have refuge in Afghanistan and he had bases there. But a. You would think, I mean, a lot of it was done, you know, a lot of the people who were involved in it were, were spending time in apartments in Germany and stuff, as I recall. You, in principle, it's the kind of thing you could cook up without having some country that's your home base and, and without having these huge facilities to train people. But my second question is, my default question, if, if, if I'm wrong about that, is, okay, suppose you need like a real terrorist camp because and, and maybe the reason is it's not that easy to brainwash people into being suicide bombers it's really not americans worry too much about that in a certain sense i mean they think that like uh you know th- there's an infinite supply of these guys and, and in fact i mean it's still not clear that all of the al-qaeda guys on those planes on 9-11 knew they were going to die um but uh in any event my question is the Taliban already controls large parts of turf in Afghanistan. If they want somebody to set up a terrorist camp, if you need turf, they can do that, right? I mean, this is an honest question. I don't, I don't understand exactly what the scenario is where you need a whole country run by somebody friendly to you if you're going to do a 9-11 style thing. I, I encourage... Well, I guess the, isn't the argument that, yes, but when we were there, we could bomb them and now we have much... Uh, much oh, more can, trouble bombing. We can them. still bomb them. I, I mean, it's a little harder because we don't have bases as close, but we have, we can reach wherever they are. Uh, now it may be that we can't react on such short notice, so it's harder if they're moving around and so on. But right, you know, broadly speaking, that's anyway that that's not that's a, an interesting question in its own right. My question is is not that. My question is is it in fact. Uh, easier to do a 9-11 style thing to any significant extent if rather than the Taliban controlling a ton of land in Afghanistan, which they already did, they control all of it. I, I want to hear, I want to hear how that makes, mm-hmm. you know, a suddenly have to start worrying about 9-11 again. I, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't the, understand um, it. I've always thought that there was tremendous potential for a, a, a completely, uh, you know, remote internet uh, internet conspiracy that would do tremendous damage, like a flash mob. But uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, that uh, yeah. that wasn't the situation before. I assume that nine eleven was planned in a sort of slightly less uh, advanced state of internet society, where people actually wanted to go talk to Osama bin Laden. Um, yeah, it was. Um, I mean, you know, there was email. Uh, there wasn't social media to speak of for uh, recruiting purposes. It was just starting to happen online. Yeah. But I think you're right. That's another, you know, I, 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 it's a good point. I mean, that they may need stretches of turf and control of countries to do these things even yeah. less than they did then. Yeah. So, social media is making everybody a terrorist. I'm completely disgusted at, with, uh, you know, big tech at the moment because they Apple has taken all my favorite songs and put them into a, a category called music you love and I have to click on this fucking button that says 
music you love. Well, who's Apple to tell me which music I love? Maybe I don't like it today. Um, it just, it just, I'm, I, that, that sort of set me off. And I'm sure that it, there'll be a huge, there's going to be a huge widespread revolt against, uh, the sense that we're being mothered by big tech. It's going to be very teenage. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing, uh, I mean, I don't do Facebook to speak of, but I know they had this habit of like, hey, here's a memory of yours. And it's some picture of someone that for all they know, you're conspiring to kill or something. You hate them so much. <laughs> I mean, the, the, you know, or it's somebody who you loved who is dead or I, now they, you know, their AI, I'm sure, does its best to avoid that stuff. But it's like, just, just shut up. Just shut up. Leave me alone. If it said, here's somebody you want to kill, that would be. That would be, that would be good. Use, that would be a much more refreshing. I would. Function, I, would yeah. I would. I would. I would pay. For, I would pay for that feature. Google Photos <laughs> does does this thing too. Everybody's doing this. Oh, and God, Microsoft is the worst. Microsoft is the crudest about this. I can't figure out. I, actually, maybe I did finally figure it out by by googling massively. But how to get Windows to quit telling me that it's the birthday of several people each day? That I don't know. Like, I agreed to friend them on Facebook at some point in the distant past. It's like, leave me alone. Or I, I don't know how, I, I, I don't know. But, but Microsoft is, I think, the, the worst at this game. And, huh. uh, that's my last Which, word. On it, it's not telling me about it on anybody's birthday. I'm feeling left out here. I don't know what I did. Well, I have, it may be that I have Outlook and I have, uh, I have Outlook 365. I have, and don't make don't get me into Microsoft's branding issues, like the different kinds of outlooks you can have. Yeah. Uh, so, um, was there a tech thing? The, oh, their emails, the email programs are awful. I agree. Um, uh, Seems like COVID, there's a tech story. COVID but, or infrastructure? Which one do you want to talk about? Well, I just COVID. I can't believe how fast the deaths are rising in America. I mean. Uh, I think we're up close to the seven day rolling average being 1100. Probably two or three weeks ago, it was 200. And lately the spike is just, I mean, again, this is just faster relative to caseload growth than Britain. And it's still happening. If you, now on the caseload growth, if you squint, you can see the curve, not yet plateauing, but the slope uh, becoming less steep. I mean, you can, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's happening, but I was it just did happen say, we, in Britain both, about now, about now we, in Britain's history. Sorry? I was just going to say, in Britain's, you know, Britain got Delta sooner than we did. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you if you look at when their curve, their caseload curve started flattening and then dipping, although sadly at some point it plateaued and started rising gently, Um, the... uh. We are about now where they were in in like number of weeks after the curve just starts grow, growing in the yeah. first place, the Delta curve. We're about where they were when their things started flattening. Yeah. Now, that may not be relevant, but I'm hoping it when is. When their things started falling, I mean. Well, first it, the slope flattened, yeah, and then it started falling. It fell yeah, sharply. Well, well, we've but been then squinting at this up. curve for a couple of weeks now and sensing that the rise was slowing and uh, and it hasn't happened. It I think you can actually make yet. the case now. I, I think it actually is. It's just at a very, it's a very brief interval where the slope is is less steep, and it's not yet clear if it's for real. Um, is this cases or deaths? This cases. is cases per capita in the U.S. Yeah. Or cases period. Um, either way, I have I have uh, on COVID. I have uh, first um, uh, third the third vac shot. Uh, you can get it's reserved for uh, for people who have uh, are in the high risk category mm -hmm. at the moment. That's bullshit. In L.A., you can work walk into a certain chain of drugstore and they'll just give it to you. Well, there's a guy. Did you read about the guy who got 20 shots because there were financial incentives? It's like you get a fifty dollar <laughs> no. gift certificate every time or something. No. He made a lot. He made a lot of money and he ain't getting COVID. I don't. Think. I'm, I, I'm sure. Well, and that's the thing. Um, the other thing is a, a reader, and I and I will uh, I will I will give the link to his site. Uh, made a list of uh, of studies showing that even mild COVID causes cognitive decline, 
and I posted it about an hour ago, and some some uh, readers on Twitter have said that they're not. It's not very impressive. You you can go to it and uh, decide for yourself. But um, wait, this was I, a, I think it's this entirely was a, possible. It's not. It's not impossible that we're all going to get COVID and we're all going to get cognitive decline. I mean, that's a possible 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 result of this is all of humanity gets two percent stupider. Uh, yeah, well, the great thing about being our age is we won't be able to tell. It's happening anyway. Just live with it. It'll just happen faster. That's not yeah, but, good. Yeah, but you won't... I, I mean, the, the more your cognition declines, the less capable you are of distinguishing between the, the rate it would have happened at and the rate it's happening at. So but it, it'll be, it'll be a, a, a virtually blissful process. But um, did you say this was a study? There are like five or six studies. I thought there were nineteen, but there are five or six of them, uh, and they and they do involve mild, not only severe cases. And of course, they don't know whether it goes away because they can only test the short term. But um, and your brain is adaptable, etc. But um, yeah. anyway, the effect might be pronounced. Who am I speaking to? Who are you? Uh, you, you look familiar. Yeah, <laughs> we laugh, but. Well, you know the Jimmy Stewart movie, Harvey, where, what is the line? It's like, something like, I've seen clever and I've seen nice and it's better to be nice. Those may not be know, the but, exact words, but just remember that uh, should should kind boy, of Boy, do I not want to remember that. But um, That's a great, Harvey's a great movie. And that's a great line. Is Harvey about a guy in decline? He's about a guy who sees a rabbit. No, uh, he, he's, a, he's an, he, this was back in the days when you could be playful about alcoholism. Uh, right. and, and he's an alcoholic, but you know, he's a good drunk and, uh, he does see a rabbit, but he's a good guy. And there's just this one line that's relevant. It's like, right. I'm just saying, if we're getting dumber super fast, just remember, according to Jimmy Stewart, it's better to be nice than smart anyway. And since that'll, that'll be, make it easier nice, for the robots to take over, get better. Um, the, uh, it seems like uh, it, it. It seems like we should discuss ivermectin and these alleged cures, just on the grounds that, like, there was this uh, talk show host uh, named Liv Phil Livingston, I think, in, who was a very nice guy, apparently. And there's this uh, sort of ha incredibly disturbing audio of him saying, "Well, I got ivermectin now. You know, I'm doing fine." And of course, he died. Um, died of of COVID or ivermectin or COVID, what? COVID, oh. and he was not vaxxed. Yeah. So the, obviously, people should not think any of the things we discuss are alternatives to getting vaccinated. But um, well, they are as, being put. You know, Brett Weinstein has pushed ivermectin as, and that's why he's. Uh, I don't want to overdramatize it, but this is a little bit of a crisis for him. I mean, former allies are saying uh, that that he's being irresponsible. And but it, it, as I was driving here yesterday morning, I was listening to talk radio, and they were all going, you know, well, let's let's not let's not debate about the vaccine, but there's there's this ivermectin, so they're still talking about it. It's ridiculous. Well, I think you know, as a matter of like evidence, the jury is still. Kind of out. Now, Now it's completely clear Brett Weinstein has been gravely irresponsible, okay? He has had uh, people on that I don't think you should have on, in at least one case, a kind of plainly, a couple of plainly, to my mind, unreliable people on his show. He has himself said, and I think this was about the prophylactic effect, not the, the therapeutic effect of Ivermectin, he, he has said, the evidence suggests that it is close to 100% effective in, I'm pretty sure it was preventing COVID. And so he was saying more effective than Pfizer. And he was basing all of that on a study that is manifestly dubious. And he's just, uh, and, and this is now being pointed out by erstwhile allies of his who are, who are like, you know, yeah. including people you haven't heard of probably, but, but have these, these intellectual dark web friendly podcasts and stuff. Well, we could have a great debate over whether any of these alternatives works. Obviously, Regeneron is useful. There's a new drug out of Texas A and M that some people. But Regeneron, think is uh, to be clear, is a therapy, not a prophylactic, right? Okay, right. A, a treatment. I think that's what I said. Right. Didn't I say treatment? 
You may have, but but just because I was just talking about the the prophylactics. I mean, I mean, we're not talking about vaccine substitutes. Is ivermectin general. supposed to be a prophylactic? Yeah, it's supposed to be both. See, yeah. there are studies about one, studies about the other, studies about both, yeah. and uh, I I I think you you know the most. It's not looking great for the claims that it can do but, much good on either front. But, but what's it, disturbing? What's disturbing is when it becomes an alternative to the vaccine, and that is how it was presented on talk radio when I just two days ago. Yeah, so. that's how. I mean, Brett, that's what he takes. He takes it once yeah. a week. And by the way, one of the other big uh, boosters of this that he had on his show was taking it regularly, and he got COVID. He was taking ivermectin as a prophylactic and got COVID. Uh, it can happen with a vaccine, but again, Brett had said it's close to 100 percent effective. Um. Anyway, I'm I intend to be the last guy to get COVID. Well, I'm doing. Life. I'm. I'm. God knows, I'm not taking many risks. Uh, I um, mean, not so much out of choice. It's just that lately, circumstance has not. Uh, has right. not put me in many. It helps situations. if you have no friends. This is a, a huge asset going forward for both of us, Mickey. <laughs> Maybe we have each me, but... other, but we avoid seeing each other in person. So it's a pretty safe situation. No man is a failure who has no friends. Is that your? Is that? Is that a Mickey Cow saying? Is that in Bartlett's under your name, or did somebody else say that? No, I just uh, that's a uh, an inversion of "It's a Wonderful Life." Um, um, uh, um the uh, as a failure who has, who has friends. friends would be the thing. Um, so, did you want to? I mean, look. First of all, quick news flash: you read about the Nirvana Nevermind album thing? No. Oh, it's important. You, do you remember what the album looks like? The album cover? It's like a baby. Baby underwater. Yeah. They the killed baby. the baby to make that album cover? No. They should have, because the baby is now 30 and is suing. Oh, on, really? on grounds that it's child pornography, because the baby didn't have any clothes on. The baby the baby wants a piece of the action. The baby's parents sold the picture, apparently, for $200 to the record company or whatever. And the baby's lawyer, I shouldn't call him a baby, he's 30, says... This man has never met someone who hadn't already seen his genitals. <laughs> and so I, anyway, I didn't I didn't yeah. look for the genitals when I see the album, but yeah, now I, I, will. I, I couldn't have told you offhand. But uh, um, now I will, now I will examine them carefully for distinguishing characteristics. Definitely. Um, uh, yeah, we do have to confirm that this man is, in fact, the baby. And, and that, that, would help. that seems like a complete bullshit lawsuit. Well, it's probably being treated with skepticism uh, on in, in more than one circle. Um, uh, there, there. This was an exciting day, exciting week on Capitol Hill, because the House moderates rebelled against Pelosi and said, "Look, we're not going along with your big Democratic wish list reconciliation bill unless you first pass the smaller bipartisan hard infrastructure bill." And this was billed as a uh, test of wills, a showdown, uh, and uh, it was resolved. And, and now most of the press, virtually all the press, is saying, well, Pelosi really won uh, because, uh, you know, she seems to have agreed to consider the bill at a certain date, August 27th, uh, September 27th, that is before the the date when th they're planning to consider the the uh, Democrats only bill so that in theory the moderates could team up with Republicans and pass the bipartisan bill and then turn around and drive a really hard bargain on the uh, on the Democratic bill if not sinking it getting a whole bunch of stuff thrown overboard and and I don't th it seems like the the press has been entirely too pro Pelosi on this I don't see where where you, she, where you, you don't think their leverage is diminished much I don't, I don't, I think their leverage has increased. They stood up to her and they, and they held together and they got her to make some concessions and they weren't the, that wild, that huge concessions. But, you know, she, uh, the theory is, well, she could, if they pass the bill, she can refuse to send it to the president. Well, A, give me a break. She's not going to, Biden's not going to say, oh, sure, hold on to this bill. That's one of the big jewels of my administration. Let's talk about Afghanistan or something. And B, once they know that the bill is going to go to the president's desk, even if she delays it, she's not going to rip it up. 
So the the moderates have won. They can they can proceed to drive a hard bargain in confidence that the smaller bill is actually going to become law. And they also say that well, the progressives can tank the bill anytime they want because there are not enough Republicans to join with the Democratic Democrats who would still support it to pass the smaller bill. I'm not sure that's true. I think they're whistling past the graveyard. So, so I'm I'm anyway. Okay. So so can I can I just review? I think I've got like uh, maybe it's uh, well I, I continue to have trouble wrapping my mind around this situation. Let me see if I understand the basics. Okay, there is the bipartisan hard infrastructure bill, right? And that's a bill, and and that uh, has, has has now passed both houses. No, it's passed the Senate, and it's. Okay. Goes over to the House where it's sitting on Pelosi's desk and she hasn't brought it up for a vote. And she won. And then there is the kind of budget resolution, which isn't a bill, bill, bill. Right. But it, it embodies the soft, the human infrastructure stuff, including stuff you don't like, like child tax credit. And and, and massive now daycare subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. And now that yeah. has been passed in both houses, and but but that's not the end of that game because it now has to evolve into actual, you know, legislation that does stuff and then be voted on again. Is that it? Yes, th- yes. There's some there's some complicated Michigas set out by the parliamentarian that that lets them pass this reconciliation to the budget, uh, which is like a modification of the budget. But which has the force of law. But before they can do that, they have to actually have some sort of budget framework in place, which they now have, which sets sort of rough limits. And and it doesn't have the force of law. But then when they go in and modify it, it will have the force of law. So they've done step one in both houses. And now they have to do step two, starting in the House which is fill in the details that will have the force of law now, within these budget numbers. Okay, does Pelosi plan to fill in the details and get a vote before she gets a vote on the hard infrastructure bill? Well, that would be a huge lift. She expects it by the end of uh, September, I believe. And so that's a few days after which she's promised to, quote, consider the other, the smaller bipartisan bill, and I guess she could consider it for a few days and then they would all come to a vote at the same time. I think the, the, the betting has to be that they won't get it done by October 1st. But even if they do, then there's a whole negotiation with is the number low enough for cinema and, and, uh, mm-hmm. mansion to approve it in the Senate. And the, 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 the negotiations might just start then. You know, it's not, won't necessarily be finished. Uh, and and then and then that reconciliation bill has to go to the Senate, where Manchin and Cinema will do their work. What what my my paranoia, my hope was that the House moderates would have so much power that they could say, "Okay, liberals, we'll support your reconciliation bill, but let's limit these child tax credits. Let's have them be smaller. Let's have them be only for one year, or let's get rid of them entirely. Let's lower the budget number." Let's uh, get some of the fat out of it. And then, sure, then then we'll go along with it. And what I worry is that Pelosi has cut a secret deal. And there all, there's all this word that there were there are side deals to this that were not publicized. Yeah. And one of the side deals was that somehow this uh, the, the moderates agreed that whatever bill they passed would be passable in the Senate. Well, of course. Pelosi wants it passable in the Senate, so I don't see where that's a victory. And my worry is that Pelosi extracted a promise from the moderates that they would vote for the bill. So that that throws all this leverage to throw shit overboard uh, right. out the window. So that would be a terrible I mean, secret deal from my point of view, well, in and a, a way, huge if, victory for Pelosi. If she didn't get a secret deal, then the whole leverage thing has kind of been overdone, right? I, I mean, the moderates yes. were saying they wanted they wanted to... Uh, do the budget resolution. Um, uh, they want to do hard infrastructure first. And then it was thought that then you'll have a lot of, uh, negotiating. Uh, then you can do whatever the hell you want on the, on the resolution. But, but where the rubber meets the road is not in the budget resolution per se, which, which, which they have now, uh, voted yeah. for and gotten passed. Um, it's in, it's in the, it's in the details and those don't. Right. But you're completely right. If she's cut the secret deal, which I've, in my paranoid, fevered imagination, uh, 
sense is there like a ninth planet, uh, then Pelosi has won the moderates, didn't have much leverage, and, and all the leverage has been delegated to Mansion and Cinema. So whatever they, uh, whatever they want will pass the Senate. Uh, but nobody else, nobody is actually reporting this. This is just a product of my, my mind. Doesn't mean it's not happening though. No. Some products of your mind happen. Exactly. But can you, can you think of any offhand? Is there a pro, uh, in your entire um, life, is there a product of your mind that has actually happened? Uh, I think I maybe was paranoid that Leon Wieseltier was conspiring against you. <laughs> you nailed that did, one. Did that ever happen? I did it. We'll talk about that in the parrot room. I mean, like, <laughs> like we haven't talked about him enough in the parrot room, right? But what the hell? Uh, this is um, a rerun. This is a summer rerun. I'll say something <laughs> no, about him I've already said, but we're on vacation. I, I can say you that. You asked I can me for that. an example. I came up with an example. Right. I'm sorry it's a familiar example. You want a new example? Um, and I didn't worry enough. I didn't worry enough. That means, so I should be more like you. I should be more paranoid. I didn't know. It just came out of the, came out of the blue, the thing I'll describe in the parrot room. It just, it was just um, horrible. Uh, <laughs> it was awful. Uh, I, I have, I have one more topic to bring up if you, if we have time. Sure. Um, I'm on vacation, well, got nothing but time. There you go. Um, the, uh, there was this big argument, did, did the added, I, I, this is a riff off of Paul Krugman column yesterday. Uh, there was this big argument, did unemployment benefits discourage people from going to work? I, I find it hard to believe they didn't, since I've heard interviews on NPR where people say, you know, now, now I have my $600 in unemployment benefits a week. I've discovered, you know, medieval lesbian fiction, and I'm devoting my life to that for a month. I'm not even thinking about going back to work. Um, uh, the, but there's studies that sort of poo poo this or one of them that supposedly poo poos it actually shows a fairly substantial effect. But never mind. Obviously, a lot of it is not the unemployment benefits. It's that people realized in this hiatus that they hated the jobs they would be going back to. And, uh, this, that's what Krugman concludes. And, I, I agree with that. They, if you talk to restaurateurs, that's what they say. They say, you know, people say, well, they want new careers. They don't want to come back to being waiters. Um, that's fine. But what are the great new jobs they think they're going to get? That's, that's the mystery Krugman doesn't address. And I think it might be a bigger deal than people think. I mean, people think it's, Oh, well, they think they can go back to school and learn some skills and become nurses, highly skilled paid nurses, and that's a better career for them. That's one thing. If they're millennials who are looking out on the landscape and think, you know, there's nothing capitalism has to offer that I want to do. Who wants to be the best insurance salesman in the, in Southern California and make a lot of money? That's just, that doesn't speak to me. And they're sort of, they're like the beats and the, in the 50s and the hippies in the 60s, they just rejected what capitalism has on offer. Uh, that would be a big, huge cultural deal that people haven't really remarked on. And I just don't know millennials enough to know if they have it in them, you know? There's uh, also Zimmer. I don't know that, what that would mean. Yeah, there's also Gen Z. Okay, well, them too. I know nothing about Gen Z. I, I tend to mush them all they're, together. They're like millennials, except younger. Um, okay, well. The, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, as a technical matter, uh, even if Krugman's right, the unemployment benefits are technically being a disincentive. They're, they're functioning that way. You know, if it's the case that the people would be living with these jobs they hate, otherwise, then it then it has had that effect. So you can, you can chalk that up as a victory, I guess. You'd rather people have jobs they like. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I mean, look, I, I don't think, I don't know the exact, I mean, I, it's interesting. I, I would guess that among Zoomers and millennials, you have maybe a higher percentage who say they, who they advocate out and out socialism then you had among the beats, maybe even the hippies. I mean, there's a lot of that around. Now, what they mean by socialism may be up for debate, but 
uh, that in turn, I mean, to speak to your point of, you know, rejection of capitalism, I mean, I don't, I have not heard capitalism as full-throatedly rejected since the, the, the hippies, uh, since, since kind of late 60s, early 70s, uh, as it is, seems to be rejected now, certainly by progressive elites in millennial Zoomerland. Right. It, I, but I'm worried about what they mean by socialism as a guaranteed income. And since I think work is centering and life sort of falls apart without the uh, the focusing the, the, framework of work. Uh, the guaranteed that's income, solution, though, that's, point of view. that's not just a, that idea isn't just like a subset of socialism. There's a lot of non-socialists who want that. In fact, I think some of them right, but I, want it but, as a way but, to, pr- to preserve capitalism. Right. They, they They say, oh, you don't have a job here. Take this money. We're keeping the system the way it is. Right, but that, but that is, but I'm worried that what that is maybe what the millennials mean, or we'll keep the situ- system the way it is in some sort of adulterated, less efficient, less potent form, and uh, and but what they really want is the guaranteed income part because that relieves them of all these choices, and then their work can be you know working on their novel. Um, I, I I don't have a solution to this except. Uh, you know, there it should be. Uh, somehow, the solution to this is is bound up with the solution to the problem of atomization and loneliness and lack of community and lack of interaction. And if you if people actually were doing their shitty jobs as part of a, a community of people where they felt they were welcomed and not alone, and uh, uh, it would be the job would go down a lot easier. Right. And the other point is that the only really happy people I know are small business people, and that that maybe uh, some sort of devolution into a a smaller, less less corporate economic landscape is is it may be the old the old the crazy antitrusters who didn't want to just br- break up big business for efficiency's sake, but wanted to break up big business for the social characteristics of small business, well, were onto something. I didn't I'm know going about back that. I didn't time. know about I that. Reading... I didn't Sorry? know about that as an argument for antitrust action. That that small businesses just have better like social and cultural consequences. Well, that was that was uh, there's a whole populist uh, strain of antitrust argument that's like that. When I was at the FTC, Al Doherty, who was the head of the competition section, that was his whole animating philosophy. It wasn't efficiency and lower lower co- consumer prices. It was uh, we like the social landscape of small businesses better than we like uh, big businesses. So um, hmm. it's it's not me. But all these ancient things are like I was reading uh, Hillary Clinton's graduation speech, the one where she talked about we need more meaningful lives with, with more e- ecstatic. <laughs> the word ecstatic was in there. Um, it spoke to me at least. At least it was only it, it used to seem like total bullshit. It only seems like half bullshit now. Um Half of it actually was, uh, you know, spoke to our times. It matched the moment, Bob. She also, remember, briefly embraced the phrase, the politics of meaning, although I think then became clear that Michael Lerner, I think she decided not to tie herself so closely to Michael Lerner, who was popularizing that phrase. It was, yeah, it was one of those phrases you don't know quite what it means. But, um, yeah, no, I, uh, look, I, I just, I, again, will say, Things are changing in a, in a technologically driven way, at least as fast as as we can respond wisely to. And uh, it would be okay with me if the rate of technological change slowed down. And when that is a side effect of a policy and people complain about it, like, for example, some of my kind of... Uh, Schemes for 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 uh, more progressive uh, use of international economic institutions, uh, like for example, um, you know, s- truly strong labor accords, environmental accords, in, uh, in at, at the WTO or, or other international bodies. W- when people say, "Oh, but you know, you'll you'll slow things down, and and there you know there there won't be." The same, you know, the burden on on business will dull the incentive to innovate or some shit. Like, bring it on. We we are. I think the biggest problem we face right now, at it, at the roots, is the rate of technological change. It it's it's happening too fast. So when people argue that immigrants bring 
innovation and technological change to America you that carries has no purchase with you. The immigrants don't bring the technological change. They're a, they're 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 in a way a substitute for it. I mean, you know, McDonald's can either well, that's uh, automate lower more or hire lower level workers, lower wage workers. Oh, that's and, definitely true. But at the low level, that's definitely true. But in terms of like, you know, bringing highly educated, you know, super ambitious immigrants uh, who are going to start businesses, one of the big arguments that you hear from people is, oh, well, they'll innovate. Well, if you think we've had enough innovation, thank you, uh, uh, then that argument doesn't have much weight. Of course, you're not are you you're even against immigration innovation in the healthcare sector and medical sector, aren't you? I'm not against innovation. I have just uh, I have just said that there, as in I, you know, again, I wouldn't have an anti-innovation policy per se, something designed to stop innovation. I'm just saying when policies have good effects, and then one of the downsides is to dull the incentive to innovate or something. That's not necessarily a bad thing. On healthcare, the problem is a little different. I mean, what I've been talking about is like social dislocation is like adolescents suddenly on social media and the first generation that encounters it just has trouble handling it and stuff like that. Um, but as for healthcare, what the in what rapid innovation tends to do is it it does it, it makes it harder to produce equitable healthcare, I would say. It makes uh it makes universal care more expensive unless you exclude the main body of the population from the best, most expensive therapies. And uh, but uh, that's not that's not really a hobby horse of mine. I'm just saying, uh, you know, a, a slowed rate of innovation is something civilization would survive to say the least. The other the thing I say about immigration is, um, you know, as you would probably agree, maybe not, but a certain amount of the plight of American uh, workers that is actually due to uh, technological innovation, in other words, the automation of, of the workplace that's that's pushing out human workers, a certain amount of that is, I think, attributed to the effect of, immigrant, of low-wage immigrants because that's a politically convenient thing to do. I mean, I don't recall Trump complaining much about how automation, tell me if I'm wrong, but you compare the number of times he complained about the, the uh, immigrants to the times number of times he complained about how automation is eliminating traditional jobs. I think as a political matter, it's, it's easier just to complain about the immigrants. But I think, as you'll agree, a lot of the problem is actually the automation. Well, it's both. Well, okay, but we don't talk about it as if it's – the people in your ideological realm don't talk about it as if it's both by and large. Maybe you are you know some academic elites who do, but the politicians don't. The, the people who the mobilize the movement the, don't. The Center on Immigration Studies certainly does. I right, mean. But, but, but in terms of the public discussion that gets out to the voters, th there's a huge disproportion of emphasis, I would say. Yeah. But there are a lot of jobs that can't be automated and – you want the wages? That's to stay what they're high saying now, job. dude. What? That's what they're saying now. I mean, you um, know, they 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 have actual journalism being done by AI. You know, it's like I remember a time when they couldn't, you couldn't imagine a human being. I mean, something other than a human being writing a story about like the outcome of a baseball game. You know, so and so defeated so and so. The winning run was blah blah blah. Right. They they can do a pretty good job of that stuff now. Uh, in a lot of local journalists do a terrible job you a lot of local papers you you never really find out what happened because the, they don't do a very yeah, good job maybe of maybe this will it. uh automation will solve the crisis of bad well numbers. especially if if our iqs go down by you know four points because of the covid induced uh cognition deficit the machines will find it much easier to emulate us um well that's those are all the big things i had to talk about well, we've been talking about an hour, so uh, we needn't feel shameful about ending the conversation here. Let's see how long have we been talking. Um, uh, fifty-nine minutes and forty seconds. Well, well, I have. I mean, I have some second-order things to talk about. We can talk about the courts. Uh, well, if they're sexy, save them for the parrot room. If they will, you know, if they're like. If people yeah. will not be able to resist the lure of going to patreon.com slash parrot room and 
showering us in cash, then then they they belong in the parent room. So if it's about like your recent uh, sexual escapades, for example, don't talk about those now, Mickey. No, I won't. But no, I have a cup. I have one one parent room worthy discussion, and we can talk about the firing of this ESPN woman. Uh, oh, uh, I didn't know about that. Me, I uh, we can talk about the Weinstein's. My friend. Megan Dam, who we had on our show, I th- think is scheduled to have the Weinsteins on her podcast, the Unspeakable Podcast. Megan, that, Bob, that's something we don't have. No, we had Megan. Megan was in the parrot room, okay? And I should have at that point said, Megan, if you ever have the Weinsteins on, ask them the hard fucking questions, okay? We will be watching. We will be watching. <laughs> and well, if she go- doesn't ask them the hard questions, seriously... She's going to regret ever having made our acquaintance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, if, they, if they do go on, I will watch. She um, does some fucking patty cake IDW friendly shit just because that's kind of her, her mind. She can be pretty tough. I would not. Uh, I'm reserving judgment. I'm reserving I would judgment. Not hurl around adjectives like that. I'm patty just cake. saying, I think you and I have the influence to make this a career ending event for her if she doesn't. Do what I, I don't, say. Where is really should be a career ending event for the wine size? Ah, uh, there are people who think that's already <laughs> that that day is already here. But we'll um, talk about that in the parrot room. I mean, I, I so I have I said last week in the parrot room. I think not in the uh, public podcast, but that this week in the parrot room. I want to play this quote from Brett that I think kind of is the is the Rosetta Stone to my. One of my two grand unified theories, hypotheses about the Weinstein brothers. One being that they're both cranks. That's the one this applies to. And then one being, well, I did, I brought this out last week in the parrot room, but I guess now I can say it publicly that they're both cowards. Th- that one, I mean, they're, they're just refusing, you know, which is hilarious if you know what the intellectual dark web was supposed to be. They're both refusing to engage qualified critics or, Pretty much any critics uh, on on subjects that uh, that have been at the center for both of them uh, of their of their rhetoric for all for pretty long time. In 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 Eric's case, his grand his theory of physics. In Brett's case, the whole ivermectin you know vax skepticism thing. They're like there are people who have serious critiques. They will not they will not engage them publicly. But- but you're going to have so much more to say about this subject in the parrot room. I'm going to have a little more to say about that. But but then the main thing is the Rosetta Stone to the first grand unified theory about them being cranks. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, I have one topic. I, 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 I've been thinking uh, on the issue of what the fuck I've done with my life. Um, it's There are some jobs that just do not pay off. and do, And I want to talk about them in terms of looking back on your life how much you know what, what was it worth it i want to warn our paying customers away from some jobs mickey warns customers perhaps some jobs that i've had maybe away. not well i'd love to talk about my job history um anyway i thought that since it, since my since i'm not completely clear on my thinking on that i thought it might be useful to talk about um, okay. So I am going to talk, let's see, what else? We, we said we would, uh, I would revisit a, a weasel tear uh, anecdote that, um, has left me traumatized, but I'll try to struggle through that and relay it. Um, the, uh, I taped Ezra Klein's New York Times podcast earlier this week. Really? Yeah. It was about, it was about, uh, it hasn't aired. It airs tomorrow. And in the pair room, I'll talk about why I think I did a bad job and, and what my excuse is. I have a good did you, excuse. Did you nail him to the wall the way you want Megan to nail the Weinsteins? Well, he was the interviewer. I wasn't. It's his podcast. Well, you could throw it back in his face. Yeah, I really regret not doing that, Mickey. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> Thanks for the tip on how to how to get to appear on uh, on high high profile platforms. Always shower disrespect. On the person with the the influence Did is you that the way it works? the parrot room? No, he didn't ask about the parrot room. It was about uh, Afghanistan. What am I supposed to say? As we say in the as I said in the parrot room, Ezra. 
Yeah, See, this is why I get invited on these things. And you, oh, actually, though, you were an Andrew Sullivan. You were an Andrew Sullivan. That's quite the honor. That's why he's Ezra Klein and you're Bob Wright, because you, there are some things you won't do. <laughs> like plug uh, your there's show. There's an old joke about lawyers. There's a lawyer joke. We'll tell the lawyer laboratory rat joke in the pair room for people who haven't heard it. Yeah, which that's ha- not has the same punchline. You remember that? You know that joke? Yes. That's not uh, much of a lure. Uh, lure is. This no, isn't but really there's two about parts hunting, to it. it? There's two parts to it. Oh, oh, you know what? I, no, we'll save this for later. My, this is this joke is too good to spend. You know, we've we've got so much other alluring content in the pair room. I think that's it. I could say a little more about Ted Lasso. I've watched more. Uh, you know, it's it's Apple Plus's or Apple TV Plus's big hit. I think. Um. Uh. Let's see what else. Oh, oh we we also yeah. had that controversial fan video. We could talk about. We could. Controversial. Uh, it was a. Uh, it was audio. I think controversial fan. Well, uh, it was well, a mashup was, no. of the parrot room right. done by a, a, a fan. Uh, I could talk. Uh, maybe I'll save that. Uh, that seems like enough for one parrot room. I mean, maybe I'll get into how AI can save the world, and maybe I'll save that for another day. Um. So uh, I think that's about it. So so again. This is going up Thursday evening. Uh, Parrot Room is going up Friday, uh, probably around five. Um, and, uh, and then next week, so far as we know, are we, well, wait, next week is, uh, we'll still do one probably, right? We'll do regular Friday, even though it's Labor Day weekend. Before we head off on our fun filled Labor Day weekends, we're going to tape on Friday. Is that right? Um, you tell me. Uh, you you call the shots on these things. Is next week Labor Day weekend or is this week Labor Day weekend? I don't know which one. It isn't this week. It's next okay. week. Okay. Um. Well. Uh, yeah. I mean, I be be aware for sudden changes, but yeah. But be I be alert. That, yeah. Be alert. Check our um, Twitter feeds mo- hourly yeah. on an hourly basis. Anyway. Can I can I go back to sleep now? You can go back to sleep. I first want to ask people to smash that like button. P- please rate and review the right show unless you don't like it. Um, and, uh, and read Mickey's, uh, occasional newsletter, Cows Files. About time for him to produce another issue, I'd say. No kidding. Um, um, anyway, you can read my Twitter feed. Yeah. That has all the items that would be in Cows Files, except it's so much easier to tweet them out. Yeah. Almost as good as the real thing. Not quite. Okay. So we will, and you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not just gonna him and a haw waiting for you to reciprocate by mentioning my newsletter. No, fine. We can just go. It's fine. No, totally. Don't look. Don't Mickey. No, no. Let's just go. Let's just go. I'm not, I'm not the huckster here, Bob. Let's just go. Okay. Fine. You're the, it's your job to do the promos. Mickey, I'm so fine with the way this conversation is ending. Don't worry. There was no Did obligation. Did you write anything on your part. this week, by the way, about Afghanistan? Did you write it? Did you turn out an issue? Oh, I don't turn on issue. What day is hmm? today? What day is today? Uh, well, there was the Friday, the Friday issue had, had last Friday's, um, Monday, no, Monday we had an animated video, uh, about the meaning of life. Um, then this Friday, presumably there will be at least some Afghanistan related, uh, content, yeah. assuming I managed to get the damn thing out. Ain't getting easier, but we're going to do our damnedest. Um, Great. And the last, but the last thing I would ask you to do is tell them what the name of the non-zero newsletter is. Cause again, you're under no obligation to reciprocate, Mickey. Well. Um, no, 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 no. Fine. Yeah, really. Okay. We're, we're still friends. No, totally. We're friends. This is, yeah. Um, I, 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 I think only good thoughts about you. It's fine. Your, no, no your branding is so clean and simple, Bob, that I sometimes, uh, it must be a side of my cognitive decline that I have trouble keeping track of. The non-zero newsletter and the apocalypse aversion project and the meaning of life project. Meaning of life TV, blogging heads TV and the right show. You mean those five things? Those five things? So there are five things. You said non-zero newsletter. How many things are there in the Bob Wright universe? Non-zero newsletter and the apocalypse aversion project are part of the same Venn diagram. There's a, there's a. So how many things are there in the Bob Wright universe? uh, It's countless. It's like, you know, it reminds me of the actual universe in a certain sense, Mickey. Okay, well, billions and billions of stuff. That could be why people have trouble keeping track of it. We're we, uh, we are going to do a branding streamlining within weeks. Okay, it's going to be big. 
We As your McKinsey consultant, I recommend that. Whatever we're paying you, it's not enough. So I will see you in the parrot room. Okay. Uh, have a good vacation. Will do. You can get back to sleep now. Okay. All right.